Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for part two of the 2024 East Bay Leadership Series presented by Kaiser Permanente. My name is Mark Orcutt, and I'm honored to serve as the president and CEO of the East Bay Leadership Council. Today's program is an opportunity to hear from and engage with leaders in artificial intelligence, and I hope you all brought your questions. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to spend a moment telling you more about us and what we do at the East Bay Leadership Council. We're a nonprofit organization representing hundreds of employers across Contra Costa and Alameda counties. Those employers include everything from small nonprofits serving at-risk youth to some of the largest employers and economic engines in the state. Our mission is to strengthen the economy and improve quality of life for the region. It's a big task, and we take on a wide range of policy issues to advance our mission. Some of those issues include workforce shortages, the energy future, uh, transportation funding, water reliability, and the housing affordability crisis. We've, we've talked about a lot of those issues on this series uh, as part of this series in years past. We advance our mission through direct advocacy on those issues at all level of government. We discuss those issues at policy task forces that take deep dives on the issues. We host events like today that we hope inspire, educate, and connect businesses and community leaders alike. And we lead programs that expand our impact in the community, like our Build the Bench candidate training program and a nonprofit board match program called Engage East Bay. If your employer is not a member of the EBLC, let's fix that. Our work is made possible because of the members who support us and we're proud of the results we deliver for the region and the benefits we deliver for our members. You can contact us through our website or call me anytime. I'm one of the easiest people to find. Um, and while you're all hurriedly emailing me to join the EBLC, I wanna thank and highlight today's moderator, Mojda Metazada. In, in addition to being a member of the EBLC's board of directors, Mojda is the 10th chancellor of the Contra Costa Community College District, where she's responsible for assessing, planning, organizing, evaluating the resources, programs, and services of the district to meet the educational needs of, of, of the students and, and the community. She completed her undergraduate general education requirements at the Diablo Valley College, holds a Master of Arts degree in Organizational and Intercultural Communications from CSU East Bay, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Information Systems from San Francisco State University. Go Gators, I never miss a chance to, to call out my, uh, <laughs> my school there. So uh, Mojda will join us a little later on. Now, uh, for a few thank yous. One of the council's strengths has always been our diverse membership of employers, and that diversity is certainly evident among our series sponsors. First, our presenting sponsor, Kaiser Permanente, with leadership from the council's vice chair of events, Deneen Wolford. Kaiser has recognized the important way the lead, that this series drives critical community conversations forward, and we are so thankful for their support. Our three major sponsors, AssetMark, with leadership from Ted Angus, Chevron, with leadership from Lindsey Crane, and the Martinez Refining Company, with leadership from Ann Notarangelo. Thank you again to AssetMark, Chevron, and the Martinez Refining Company for their support as major sponsors. Next, our sustaining, uh, sustaining sponsors, Marathon, with leadership from Nicole Carranza, and Safeway, with leadership from our Vice Chair of Communications, Wendy Gutshaw. Thank you to your both. Our contributing sponsors, CSAA Insurance Group, a AAA insurer, CEMEX, the Contra Costa Association of Realtors, the Contra Costa Water District, Ray Bowen Scott, H-Cycle, Hacienda, IBEW Local 302, John Muir Health, Sutter Health, Wells Fargo, and the Workforce Development Board of Contra Costa County. And for the members of our board who want to contribute as individuals, we have a special opportunity available, community leader sponsorship. Their names are on the screen. Thank you to all of our community leader sponsors for their support. You are some of my favorite board members. Don't tell the others, I've got a, I've got a lot of them. Uh, so um, thank you again to all of our sponsors. Uh, we are, our work in this series would not be possible uh, without your support. And before I introduce our featured speaker, I wanted to make a note in the change of our program. Uh, Mook Mehta, the Chief Information Officer at Asset Mark, unfortunately is under the weather and unable to join the panel conversation today. We are certainly wishing him well. 
So uh, with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our featured speaker this afternoon, uh, Jamar Thomas. Jamar is a cloud technology evangelist whose background and expertise intersect with government to create inclusive and equitable solutions. He currently serves as the lead enterprise architect at Google and has over 18 years of experience in sales and delivery. During his tenure at Google, Jamar has won several engineering awards for his contributions in the public sector. Prior to joining Google, Jamar served as the technology executive at Accenture, responsible for leading architecture de definition and complex system delivery for large clients like LA County and CalPERS. I'll, I'll say those are, those are large. Uh, Jamar is a proud graduate of Clark Atlanta University, where their motto is find a way or make one, an adage he lives by personally and professionally. So with that, Jamar, join us. Turn on your camera. The floor is yours, my friend. All right. Um, thanks for that introduction, Mark. Can you, can you guys hear me okay? I've got you good. All right, and I'm on camera, so we are live. <laughs> Let's go. Um, one second. Let me go ahead and share my screen, and then we will get started. All Zooms are created equal. The share screen is always the trickiest part of, of the entire project. One second. I'll take this I'll moment take this just to remind just folks, remind folks that that use, the use the chat if you want to have you conversations, conversations with your folks. If you have questions uh, throughout the program, uh, please use uh, the Q&A feature. We will monitor that as, as a group. So looks like you got your slides rolling. I'll, I'll get out of your way, Jamar. I'm rolling. All right. Thank you, guys. So we have a few minutes today to talk a little bit about AI. Uh, Mark, uh, before you go on mute, how much time do I have? You have about you have about 15, uh, 15 to 18 minutes to keep us on track. OK. All right. Keep me honest. All right. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about uh, AI. And there's been a lot of exciting announcements from Google uh, lately. Today, uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, a month ago, things are moving uh, very fast. And so I'll share a little bit about uh, some of these um, updates and announcements, but really educating folks uh, uh, are, and I, I work in the uh, government sector, uh, as you heard from the, 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 the intro. Uh, so I, I evangelize and I talk about all of what we have to bear from Google from a technology perspective, um, from an AI perspective, and how we can actually help really change how our public agencies operate and really enhance and modernize experiences to their constituents. And so I'll do the same um, today, but a little bit more higher level. I'll also talk about some of the use cases uh, that I'm seeing that are very uh, exciting uh, for our customers to really tackle. And some of the things that are maybe not as exciting, but are just as impactful uh, to uh, uh, our customers. And then I'll even touch on things outside of my uh, outside of this industry, uh, because I understand that we have a diverse uh, audience group. So folks can really connect the dots on how they can apply AI once you guys uh, walk away from this session and you can talk to your uh, leaders and, 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 and managers and peers about how you can kind of bring this to bear um, within your organizations. And then you know, very important aspect of all of this when it comes to AI is being responsible. And so we'll talk a little bit about how Google is leading that and how you can kind of uh, move forward with that, uh, again, as you guys uh, leave and, and go, go your separate ways. Um, so let's talk a little bit about generative AI. And I like to share this story uh, because it really touches on at this point. Uh, last year, uh, my grandmother passed away and we um, we had to we went to Chicago for the the funeral. Uh, this is where I'm from and my family's from. And it, I ended up staying at my uncle, sorry, my cousin's house. Uh, this is where a few of us were staying uh, during this time. And so during the uh, the wake, uh, we um, all jumped into the car, and my mother was driving. I think she was using my grandfather's vehicle. 
uh, for some reason she was she was a driver and now this hasn't happened in, in years where my mother has drove driven me somewhere um, usually I do the driving uh, so this harkens back to you know like childhood years but uh, the important thing is that when we got on the road um, and she had her navigation on as the navigation was speaking it sounded a lot like my mother and I didn't quite understand that and that's it, at some point I was like is this this sounds just like you, mom. And she said, it is. And so we had a discussion. And so I didn't realize, and, you know, I, I work at Google, didn't know this, um, that Waze actually has a, a custom uh, voice component. And so what surprised me was not that Waze has this capability, because I sell this capability through other products uh, within cloud. Uh, it's that she actually figured out how to use this technology and she's 60 plus years old and she was so excited about you know this very cool feature and so really this sheds light on what you're seeing on this screen because this is how she is transforming how she actually interacts interacts with technology and she um, is not necessarily in the demographic some would consider um, that would be very fashion forward as it relates to technology and so uh, this really AI is really democratizing, is bridging kind of that technology, that technical um, maybe barriers that um, that are out there. And so this is why it's really exciting. And um, and that's how, you know, we're seeing customers interact with products and users interacting with products. When you're using um, and you're conducting your day to day business, I use this all the time. And I am curious to see and maybe folks can can put up an emoji or a raised hand. Um, I actually use this every day as I go about doing my job. Anytime I need to um, maybe put together or draft an email, I, I might use uh, Gemini or some of you guys may use ChatGPT to, to draft an email or reword a certain sentence or come up with some ideas or help you draft the PowerPoint. I'm curious to see if anybody um, actually is, is uses, that, uses it as frequently as I do. It's really transforming um, how I use uh, uh, technology um, at Google. And I see I see one thumbs up. I'm, there's, I know there's more of you guys out there. There we go. Don't be shy. Um, thank you. And so I want to kind of take a step back uh, to understand how we got here. And when you look at specifically generative AI, this really starts back to 2017. Um, Sundar, our CEO, when he was hired at Google, uh, made it his mission to make sure AI is a core component of every product that we put out in the market and even internally what we use uh, at Google. And so through these innovations, you know, Google has always been a very um, open organization. And that's what a lot of people have, have enjoyed and, and, and loved about Google is that uh, we really um, help drive kind of the innovations across the technology uh, ecosystem because we are always contributing to the community on the things that we figured out. And so back in 2017, uh, we uh, released this white paper called um, Attention is All You Need. And that is what kickstarted kind of the uh, generative AI uh, uh, revolution that we are in today. Um, in fact, uh, the transformer architecture is what this white paper discussed. And that is what drives all of these large language models like the, uh, the chat, chat GPTs and, and others that you see in this, in, this, um, in this kind of this timeline. And so I wanted to really showcase that because this really shows the history of innovation that we um, have undergone. Uh, not a lot of folks realize that uh, GPT actually stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Again, that's a nod back to again this ar this architecture that we released. It really started um, a lot of the uh, startups that we see today that have become, uh, done very successful, as you can see with OpenAI. Uh, even back in 2022, some of you guys may remember there was a uh, uh, a Google employee that came out and and, and made this bold claim that you know, our AI was sentient. And, you know, this is prior to, you know, the uh, uh, GPT, chat GPT that's, that was announced uh, last year uh, with OpenAI. And so, you know, I think, you know, we wanted to make sure um, 
that we got this right from a responsible standpoint point. And it's part of the reason why it wasn't released at that time. Um, Cause we've got to make sure that we keep these things in at top of mind um, to make sure things are socially beneficial um, that, you know, we've accounted for privacy. We've mitigated bias. Uh, when you go back to kind of when we originated at Google, our, our, our chart has always been to organize the world's information and make it universally useful and accessible. And so there's a responsibility there uh, when you have kind of that, that, that charter. When you think about Google search, when folks go to search, they go there because it is something that is, um, you know, authoritative. They, they trust the results and, and a source of information. And so taking that a step further into AI and the models that we release, we want to make sure that we have that. And so, um, you know, partly, you know, the market was demanding for uh, more of these models and then, um, you know, the fact that we also were able to get the responsible AI components in place and we are now thought leaders in this space and uh, we have customers who are adopting uh, these models. We have white papers, we have tools that folks can leverage that we've shared around responsible AI so that they can also adopt it within or their organization. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really big accomplishment from Google. Now, um, recently released uh, Gemini, which is our uh, most capable uh, uh, AI generative AI model that we have to market. Um, it, it, it's a combination of efforts uh, by Google DeepMind and Google Research, the largest undertaking um, uh, uh, within Google. And we released this back in, in December. Um, if folks haven't used it, there's there's um, uh, commercial commercial and consumer versions that are out there for folks to be able to interact with it. And then we have enterprise um, uh, offerings as well. Uh, the name itself, I'm a, uh, my birthday is uh, May 28th. Uh, I am a Gemini myself. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks say I have two personalities. So that's kind of where the Gemini uh, branding has, has come from, because it is a combination of uh, Google DeepMind and, and Google Research. Now, at Google, we believe that, um, you know, it's not just about the model. Yeah, we're going to be market leaders when it comes to AI models. Um, but it's not just about the model. It's about the, the, the platform uh, for these models. And so if we're going to really transform, you know, not just interactions through chat interfaces, but transforming business processes within, you know, the uh, auto industry or the aviation industry or within government is about really creating um, really a platform for folks to be able to scale, um, for folks to be able to have different options when it comes to models. Again, um, one model, while we would like to say we'll rule the world, uh, there's multiple models. There's models by uh, Meta, you know, there, there's models by uh, uh, Microsoft and there's models by OpenAI, there's models by you know Anthropic, and so um, there are use cases or or situations where one model may be better than the other. So being able to provide an open platform for folks to be able to access all of these different models and be able to develop and deploy their own applications on it is the strategy of, of Google. Um, in fact. I think there was a, a report that, that says uh, if you look at all of the AI startups and even the, the, the unicorns, 50 percent of those startups are all leveraging Google Cloud kind of as their platform to base their business off of, which is super exciting. And 70 percent of uh, unicorns are actually using Google. And that's because we are providing kind of this this open platform for folks to be able to build and mature on. Uh, I wouldn't be a architect or engineer if I didn't show some flavor of an architecture diagram, but I'll keep this super high level. Um, today, uh, we have Gemini that you can leverage uh, within um, a chat-like chat -like experience, similar to you, you would use with uh, ChatGPT. Um, we have consumer offerings. Um, we also have um, 
the uh, business offering. So the ability to have your data protected and be able to communicate uh, via a, a chat interface on your data and is protected, um, we have uh, that as a, as a product. We also have it bundled into Google Workspace. So you think about Gmail, um, I know we're using Zoom, but you, know, you have Google Meet, uh, you have uh, uh, slides and, 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 and that ecosystem, we've uh, it bundled uh, the capabilities of our uh, G uh, Gemini models into those products for folks to be able to use those. And then for folks that want to build and develop, we have our cloud offering and we've embedded Gemini into the cloud so you can easily, uh, much more efficiently, uh, you know, create your, your environments or your, your software stacks, uh, what have you, within Google Cloud or even help you develop uh, much more efficiently uh, using uh, Gemini capabilities. And then for those folks that want to um, build on these AI models, they have a full Vertex platform at different levels. So if you happen to be um, someone that's more high level and want to get something started with your organization, uh, we have a search and conversation, which is a really a, 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 a high level um, approach for how you can actually take these models and, and, and use them uh, within your organization. I'll show a, a great demo of this, um, something that uh, Stanford Medicine has, uh, has recently released as well. Um, it's called our, our uh, search, uh, search and conversation. I'll show a demo of that shortly. And then uh, all of this is running on our infrastructure. Again, we have choices on infrastructure, GPUs, which is, uh, um, and TPUs, these are all just technologies that, uh, or infrastructures that make it easy for you to be able to run these models and deploy these models. And TPUs are, are tensor processing units. These are some Google secret sauce here um, when it comes to uh, AI, uh, um, AI specific chips that we, uh, we, we actually design. Not everyone is aware that Google is one of the uh, world's largest hardware manufacturers. And so um, these are chips that we actually have available uh, to us. So we're not necessarily dependent on um, NVIDIA for our GPUs. We actually have um, our own TPUs that can, in some cases, um, outperform uh, those GPUs by 2x or 3x, depending on those use cases when it comes to some of these AI models itself. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much on this, just be aware that we have kind of our Google foundation models at the top. And then even at the bottom, as I mentioned, we have an open ecosystem where you can leverage, you know, the llamas and the um, Mistral and the uh, Anthropic um, uh, 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 models within Google uh, as well. So what you what you what you'll see as you guys look at the demo um, offline is that you know we have a uh, an ex a way for customers to bring Gemini to their website and have a, an engaging experience. We're able to use the power of Google Search. We bring in all of your data from your website or any particular data that you may have within your organization. And then folks can interact with it to be able to get answers to where maybe they can't, it's hard to find those answers on a website because you typically have to keep clicking and hopefully you find something. Now you can just simply ask a question and we'll answer it based off of the data corpus, which is your particular website. And we're able to do this across multiple other different types of data sets to databases and, and, um, and, and the like as well. Um, so we're seeing our customers adopt this across, uh, you know, different segments, whether it be health and human services. I just showed you a, a DMV example, uh, uh, which, you know, would be kind of in that transportation sector, labor, uh, as well as education. Uh, we have folks leveraging our uh, models for tutoring purposes. So, you know, think about being able to ask questions to a tutor as you were trying to you know, learn this particular topic. If you are in K through 12 or higher ed, using these models to also then test, help help folks go through uh, certain tests uh, or a sample test so that they can prepare for an actual test and with actual feedback on why answers are correct and, and um, incorrect. So these are just some of the examples that we are using within uh, government AI. Uh, we have a, one, one of the other ones is really democratizing data. So you have the, uh, a lot of those power users 
that may, or I would say decision makers that are looking for data insights, but they don't have the SQL experience or they don't wanna to have to wait for a technical team to put together certain dashboards that they would like to have to be able to report to whoever they need to report to. Um, instead, they can ask in human language a simple question and then the SQL will be generated. Uh, the answers will be pull, pulled in, uh, the res results will be pulled in and then uh, uh, visuals in, in the form of, of charts and and even a, a, a PowerPoint or a slide deck can be generated just like that to to uh, be able to get to. And so now we're really changing how folks can actually get access to the data. So those are some of the uh, use cases that you'll see in this in this um, in the, you know in in government uh, tr using um, changing how folks interact with uh, uh, the the government because typically they're English first, maybe they're Spanish, but if you happen to speak a language such as Ukrainian, uh, being able to leverage the translation capabilities to be able to communicate now and participate in society, whereas before you had had a, a larger challenge. So those are some of the things that we're doing around the translation front and multilingual chat. Um, for those folks that are not in government, uh, I, I tried to put in uh, some examples of how generative AI is being applied in media and entertainment or retail or games. Um, if you look at uh, uh, GE, for example, they're leveraging our generative capabilities to be able to, you know, for folks who have, have purchased appliances, at some point you probably lost a product manual and, um, you know, you're trying to figure out how to service something or fix something go to their site and now you can just ask uh, a question and then it will go through uh, the data corpus of all of their manuals uh, understanding what kind of product that you have and giving, giving you the, the particular uh, answer that you need so that's an example of how GE is actually using this or uh, creating custom recipes based off of some of the um, uh, what you may have available in your refrigerator so these are some of the unique things and changing how folks are engaging uh, with uh, technology. So all of that, um, you know, to say, you know, is, is really cool stuff, but it's important that we get the, the, the responsible piece correct. And I'm not going to go over every single piece here, but choice and value is very important um, as well. So all of these models, you, you don't need a Ferrari to drive to the grocery store. And so, you know, it's important, again, to have that platform to where it's like, okay, I'm going to choose the right model for the right job. Uh, it's not always going to be the the Gemini, the largest ultra version to do something. It, sometimes it's going to be something else. And so being able to uh, uh, provide that and let you know that, hey, this model actually is better for you in this case, um, which is not something that I think most folks are aware of. And so being able to provide that as well. And then, again, I like to, to showcase our AI principles. This is not something that we just published and created last year. This has always been um, a part of our AI principles. In fact, we were one of the first organizations to really publish our, our, our AI principles and are actually helping shaping these principles with other customers, even at the federal level, and working with um, the government uh, as they start to uh, accommodate kind of like this new push in, in AI and try to get ahead of it instead of being reactive. And some of that could appear nebulous. And so specifically, what does that mean? And how do we actually uh, implement these things? Well, we have these technical mitigations. We have content filters and, and evaluations that are occurring. We're constantly monitoring these models. And when you think about filters, think about safety filters. So if someone you know, submits a prompt that has, you know, something racist in it or, um, you know, something violent, you know, these things will, we, we will um, stop and won't provide a response from. Uh, same thing if we actually go uh, it, through our training data, or sorry, through our data and we, we respond with something, we're going to do, apply those results to a filter before we send them back. Um, we have policy restrictions. We have tooling that we are providing our customers so that they can actually also go through and do uh, the, the checks on, uh, uh, and, and or sorry, they can actually go through and do the responsible AI pieces for them, them as well, uh, through tooling. So again, we're providing and we're sharing, um, as, as you would expect for, for Google. So with that, I think, um, I'm going to pause and, and, you know, ask questions if anyone has, uh, has any, and then, um, I think there's a, a, a forum, 
I'll stick around for the panel discussion and folks can ask some additional questions in too. Thank you, Tamar. Yeah. And we get to welcome most into the conversation. You can stop your screen share and we'll transition to our, uh, uh, our Q&A. Thank you so much, Jamara. That was an enlightening presentation and I loved hearing um, all that you had to share uh, with us this afternoon. Um, so at this point, I am going to ask Josh uh, to join us as well. And I'm gonna let you um, in on a little bit of information about Josh. Um, so Josh O'Brien uh, leads the Generative AI Initiative at Resolve AI. Um, this is a first, um, an AI first uh, information technology service management company focused on driving innovation in uh, employees in support of information technology, human resources, facilities, and so much more. Um, Josh specializes in AI technologies, developing AI powered chatbots. Um, and virtual assistants to enhance support systems, operational efficiency, and employee satisfaction. And uh, I'm gonna tell you what Josh's superpower is. It is addressing current and future organizational challenges to create a more efficient and supportive workplace through AI. And we can all use that, Josh. Um, so you've heard a little bit about Josh. We're gonna take 30 more seconds for Josh to share a bit more about himself and his company. Take it away, Josh. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Um, a nice introduction, I appreciate it. Uh, so I am Josh, I do lead the Generative AI Initiatives at Resolve AI. Uh, I'm relatively new to the Bay Area. I moved out there about six months ago. I still have a, a house back home in Kentucky, uh, but I find myself spending more and more time uh, in the Bay Area. It's been exciting to see Resolve AI's impact on local organizations like the city of Dublin, BART, AC Transit. Uh, we're committed to revolutionizing support, um, like mentioned, and IT, HR facilities and more, using cutting uh, edge AI models like Gemini to streamline how employees get help. Uh, so my own path into the tech industry actually started back in Kentucky. I had a community college where I earned a two-year degree. Um, after that, I was fortunate enough to land an internship at a company called Phillips Addison and Company, uh, virtually, uh, eventually working my way up. Uh, and that's why the work of uh, what you guys do is uh, super special to me. Um, working with the local community colleges and internships, it really resonates strong with me. So I'm grateful that you provide opportunities like that. And I believe they're crucial to unlocking uh, potential in people. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Josh. And yes, go community colleges. We are thrilled to have a community college, uh, another community college graduate right here with us uh, this afternoon. Yes. Um, so Jamar, we're going to have you kind of come back on camera as well. And I am going to ask a question of both of you. And I'll start with Josh. Um, are there any applications of AI in your industry that might surprise our audience. Yeah, so I'll speak from my expertise, what we do at Resolve AI. I think one of the most uh, exciting and surprising application um, is how we utilize generative AI models uh, to problem solve issues in real time on end user devices uh, through natural language. So the first step in that is um, we use uh, the AI models. So I'll keep saying Gemini, it's my favorite one. Um, Jabbar likes that too. And I'm not. I'm not just. I'm not just bluffing either. It's my favorite. <laughs> um, but uh, so people can explain issues uh, how they would explain them over the phone to a technician, right? Um, in their own language, they don't have to know the right terms to search or, or things like that, right? And so uh, the uh, application here is that we can actually take that and map it to a technical action. Um, so. Uh, the user can say my Wi-Fi is slow and we can infer a potential cause, whether that's signal strength, router issues, device settings. And then we can map that to a potential action where we can actually run speed test, um, uh, update drivers and things on the device in real time. So it doesn't, uh, another thing that we can do is kind of augment um, knowledge articles, right? Typically you may get a, uh, a knowledge article that gives you seven steps on how to open Bluetooth settings. And through generative AI and, and our platform, we can just open the Bluetooth settings for you and skip those seven steps. So I think that's a really surprising uh, use case that probably not a lot of people have uh, heard of. 
I mean, it's certainly um, the ability to create efficiencies, I think, um, are, are quite major um, and wonderful for all of the businesses that are joining us to, today to, to really learn about, including the Contra Costa Community College District, of course. Jamar, tell us a little bit, anything surprising to us? Can't, we can't hear you. Yeah, I think a lot of people might be surprised that they've been using, you know, uh, uh, AI. You know, so when we think about generative AI, I like to say that generative a generative AI or these large language models are like the world's um, greatest autocomplete. And so when folks go to search, you don't really think about this, but a lot of times we will predict what you're searching. We actually will write out, mm -hmm. hey, here it is. And you can just say, yep, that's what I want. So that's an example of how we've applied these capabilities through our products. Um, you can, you know, we have, you know, the ability to generate voices. I, I described kind of that approach through ways. So a lot of folks, you know, while we are um, so, um, uh, focused on kind of that chat experience, uh, we've actually introduced these things uh, through our products over the years that folks have already been using um, um, today. I think that's really great information. And it kind of leads to the very next question. Jamar, you talked about 2017, like, you know, kind of w the, the when AI um, started to kind of infiltrate into our universe, right? Um, and so for us, it seems that the rate of innovation and adoption of AI is staggeringly fast. Um, has this latest search, has it been a long time coming? I mean, you talked about 2017. I don't remember ever talking about, you know, chat, anything, chat GPT or AI or having that language be a part of our norm. And, you know, I'm a geek. I came from computer information systems, right? So just curious, is it really staggeringly fast? And what can we continue to expect? Well, you know, there's there's a lot of different disciplines within AI. I'm not going to date myself, but when I was in college, I took an AI course. Uh, I think it was, um, it was based on a, a rules-based uh, AI uh, language called, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Prologue. And so that was back in the early 2000s. Um, also in the early 2000s, part of uh, one of the biggest innovations that we've made in, in, in search back then was changing how we go about doing search. So we actually incorporated some AI. This is something that Larry Page, um, you know, was when he was responsible for, really started embedding AI into search. So, so this was happening back in 01. Uh, you fast forward to say 05 or even um, 06, a lot of folks come to Google for a translation. And so the first kind of translation model that we had released back in 06 was kind of a statistical, statistical machine translation which was a big innovation at the time. And then in, in 2017, we kind of transitioned more to a, a neural uh, uh, network approach to doing translations. So and that was 2017. And so fast forward now, today we have more of these translations coming from these large language models. So you can see the building blocks have, have been kind of occurring, uh, you know, one after the other, starting from, you know, whatever, point in time you want to pick, but there we've built on top of that into where we, we've gotten here. And I'm, I'm sure from 10 years from now, we're going to look at the models that we've been using today as being like just, again, a building block that no one's really talking about. They're going to be talking about what's happening, you know, the, the, the model and the approaches 10 years from now. Thanks, Jamar. And Josh, you, you know, you shared a little bit about how um, it, you are utilizing this in kind of the IT service um, sector. Um, can you talk to us also a little bit about kind of that, the speed by which things are um, just um, progressing, um, which appears shocking to most of us? Yeah, so you're right. It is ex uh, exploding onto the scene. Um, that perception um, is both real and deceptive, right? So the groundwork, like Jamar has talked about, has been laid over decades. 
Um, there's technologies like expert systems and decision trees and machine learning. While those are advancing, they've been around for many years, right? And they're less flashy than your generative models, um, but they are the, uh, you know, what kind of drives a lot of the systems that have been analyzing data, automating tasks, um, and making predictions for a long time, right? When you think of neural networks, um, th that's been around for, I think that the core concept of that dates back to like the 1940s, right? It goes back that far. Um, when you look at the last 20 years, though, um, and Jamar said Google's had a lot of part of this, but the advances in um, computing power and the algorithms um, have created networks that are so much more complex than before. Thanks, Josh. I'm going to go back to Jamar. I'm going to ask you, Jamar, we have a question that came in um, from Sherry, who indicates that she is glad to see that one of your principles that you shared with us earlier is um, to avoid creating or reinforcing unfair biases, right? So how does Google ensure that you are avoiding and not reinforcing unfair biases? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's there. there's many different approaches. And if you look at one of those slides, you'll see that we have uh, different tools that kind of help address that. Uh, but one of it is just getting the data right. Bad data in is going to be bad data out. And there's there's been research papers about how to, uh, I don't want to say sanitize the data, but that's a flavor of it. Uh, so you really want to get the, the data correct. You know, one of the, you know, examples that I share a lot is, you know, historically, you know, 15 years ago, if I go to my Google photos and I look at photos from, say, 15 years ago, a lot of it wasn't very good, partly because of um, biases in the training that was used for those those camera hardware. It just wasn't trained on darker skin complexions. So my photos just don't happen to come out very well in my families. Fast forward to, to today, uh, there is has been a whole effort of making sure that we have a specific um, color gamut of, 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 of testing that happens on these cameras so that when these things really are released, they were much more equitable. And so that's the same thing, you know, with the data. We've got to make sure that we have uh, a fair and a and diverse amount of data. I think um, OpenAI released a really cool video model that came, came out, you know, uh, last week. Or, and one of the things I was checking to see was, you know, did they have any examples of videos with you know, darker skin complexion folks, and, and they did, which was, I was really happy to see that. But that's just an example of um, how you have to mitigate it. You got to like, watch out for your data. And so we have uh, approaches for that. We have approaches for how you can actually get the right data into the model to be able to um, ground it on the responses. And so and that's just one of them. But it's a large discussion in terms of how to mitigate biases. There's multiple different approaches. But I think one of them uh, that's a big focus is just making sure that data is, is, is done correctly. Thanks, Jamar. I'm going to ask a question for both of you. Um, and I'll start with Josh this time. Um, and of course, being in education, it's important for me to learn more about your perspectives related to it. So um, it's not hard to imagine that the job market is continuously changing and it's changing fairly drastically across industries as AI solutions really um, kind of take greater hold for a variety of tasks. And Josh, you've been describing some of those um, tasks very distinctly. Um, what do you think um, those of us in the education sector should be focused on in order to prepare our students? Um, so really kind of what background skill sets and such do you anticipate needing to hire in the near future? And as you think about that, talk to us as to kind of, there, there's been conversations in the in the higher education kind of industry as to, is it really necessary to have a bachelor's degree or do we focus on a credentialing in specific areas? Um, so kind of embed that into your response. Sure, yeah, so I'll take it back to, to my middle school days, which um, age myself, it's not aging myself at all, but uh, probably 2003, 2004, 2005, I remember we had uh, entire classes on how to Google. Right. How, how do you use Google to, to search for data? Right. So they really encouraged you to leverage those technologies back in the day um, 
to, to make yourself more efficient, right? So I kind of hope we see that same thing happening with generative AI, right? I, I don't uh, see the uh, bachelor's degrees going, you know, going away per se, right? You still need industry experts. Um, language models have uh, their uh, potential to give incorrect uh, information. You, you've got to make sure that you, that that information is grounded in factual data and you've got to have an expert to look at it and make sure it's right. Um, I think you'll see uh, those specific jobs evolving, right? So you'll um, go away from a traditional maybe data scientist role. I don't want to say that, but uh, you, you'll want all of those current bachelor's degrees to be augmented with um, education in AI, because it's going to be a part of everybody's jobs, right? Um, you call it AI fluency, I guess. I like that. That's good terminology, AI mm -hmm. fluency. And I like kind of the notion of how you articulate that the bachelor's degree isn't going anywhere because we really, it sounds like we really need to be able to think critically to assess whether the information we're getting back through AI is real and accurate and frankly in many ways um as jamar was talking about kind of ethical um as well um so jamar your thoughts on that uh yeah i mean i think that um you know if i were to you know, it's funny because i i think this is is an ability to be to be more efficient and and allowing us to be able to do more and so when I think about had I had these tools was that when I was in school, um, I would have uh, been able to leverage it to uh, code faster and code better and not even just faster and better, but also to better understand topics. There's often times where you don't have the, the, the ability to be able to have a, a teacher or a mentor or a student assistant to help you get through certain tasks or activities as you are learning in your dorm. So imagine leveraging this where you can actually ask the, uh, you know, your, your, your virtual coach or your virtual student assistant, why does this, why is this incorrect or why is this wrong or how do you do this? And then it's able to create and give you the answer or even give it it's multimodal. Some folks learn through speaking and communicating and reading. Some folks are more visual. And so now you can actually figure out, well, what what works best for your learning and then use that and have generate generate generated AI communicate that um, so that you can actually learn faster. So I see it a way as a way for you to be um, as, as a tool to learn more. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I never thought you actually had to have a bachelor degree degree to be successful in life, but certainly you have to go and figure, if you're not going to go to school to get that education, you got to figure out how to get it some, somewhere else, you know, school of the hard net knocks, but there's a lot of folks that have done a lot of learning on YouTube, which is great. And so this is just another mechanism for you to be able to, uh, digest all of that information and make it make sense to you. Jamar, just just to follow up on that, you're right. I don't have a bachelor's degree. I only have a two years degree. So you, you definitely do not need one to be successful. And I, one of my biggest mentors, um, when when ChatGPT first kind of hit the scene and became accessible, he told his employees, he goes, "Nobody's getting fired, but your deadlines are cut in half." <laughs> well put. It's all about efficiencies, right? Um, Jamar, we have another question for you, and that is AI is as good as its data that's been input, right? So does Google um, use users' private data to one, um, uh, to for, for everyone's use in an anonymous way and personalize each user's AI use? Is it doing those things? Really, that's a good question. So this is one of the questions I get. I often get asked uh, from from the my customer base. Uh, does Google own our data? That kind of thing. And the, so the great answer, the great thing is, is no. So when we're and so I, and I'm going to have um, two answers. One is for consumer offerings and then one is for our enterprise offerings. Uh, so I work in the enterprise space. Our customers own their own data. We actually provide our models and our models are, you can think of it as, as frozen in the sense that uh, the data doesn't make its way, those prompts and, 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 and don't make its way into our model to where we're training it. 
um, and you you get access to the all of the updates from the model without your data. So we have our own training sets that we do. In fact, um, we have indemnification clauses, which uh, are actually at the you know highest level uh, compared to what some of our competitors provide, uh, which basically state that if uh, you know we are putting our money where our mouth is because there's been a lot of concerns about IP and you know you guys are using other people's IP and thoughts it's like no we are so confident in the data that we've used to train um, our models free and clear that if our customers ever have some form of legal issue with these models, we actually will step up and kind of, uh, uh, you know, go to court with you in the sense, I'm not a lawyer, but it's basically what that indemnification clause is for. Uh, and so now, so that's from an enterprise perspective. perspective. Now, from the consumer perspective, uh, just like anything else, you have the ability to opt out and prevent certain things from being used. Um, there was a uh, update forward where I, I have, uh, Gmail and and the such uh, for uh, my consumer Gmail accounts. A lot of us have that, but there's also now the ability where I can tap in Gemini into a lot of that stuff, but I have to opt in for that. And then there's even controls where I can have like my history deleted. And even then there's, there's very um, only certain things that actually are that potentially are carried over and it's not necessarily your data. So there's a big difference between consumer and enterprise um, and so I just want to make sure I, I make those clarifications. So Mark, can I follow up on that? Yep. So uh, yeah. So um, I, and I think what you what you're seeing the uh, AI industry kind of push toward is you don't necessarily need to train a language model for business use cases at, at this point, right? Especially for what resolved as customer support use cases. You may have heard the term uh, RAG, um, which is uh, retrieval augmented generation. Right. So what you're kind of doing is you're taking um, an end user query and you're using a, a product like I know Google's got vector searches uh, that, that you can implement with um, and you're you're grabbing that data and then you're providing it to the language model. So you're taking the question and the answer, giving it to the language model and saying, take this data and take this question and make the answer relevant to the question, contextual to the question um, and uh, provide the right amount of empathy and things like that. But like Jamar said, a lot of the models can be and should be stateless to where they don't need to be trained on your data because you're giving them the data that they need to answer the question and you're only utilizing that language model to provide a contextual appropriate response. I think related to kind of the consumer model that was being described, Jamar, um, and, and actually both Josh and Jamar, you know, I'm curious, how does a typical you know, how does a typical user, Jamar, how does your mom know um, how to ensure that, you know, her data that she doesn't want utilized isn't out there and being utilized through generative AI and other other mechanisms uh, in the on the web and in the in the universe, I'll call it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, again, when you're when she uh, use ways and she you know, use her voice to tr uh, uh, to train it. I'm sure there was some form of um, uh, disclaimer or about, hey, we're using your voice to be able to train a particular model. So it's being very transparent about how certain things are used since it's kind of around the data use policy. Uh, and then we don't use your data outside of what that specific use is for. Um, and so it's not, you know, if we if we're using it for, you know, ways in this in this case, ways for your custom voice, that can't be used anywhere else other than that particular thing. And so, because it violates our data use agreement that we that we've had with our particular consumer. Um, so, and when it comes to you know Gemini and say if you wanted to use it for your your, your Gmail and, and Docs again, uh, there's notifications as you have to opt in for certain things to be able to occur. You know, and so that stuff is in the documentation and it's 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 part of the user experience where we want to make sure we are very for um, uh, upfront about you know what's what's going to happen and not trying to hide it, and so to speak. So as users, we need to be really alert um, and not just kind of scroll past something and you know check a box okay. Really read and ensure you're understanding what permissions you're providing, right? That's correct. And this is something, and, and even, you know, when you, um, 
If you have a phone of, of Google, a lot of times, you know, or a single sign on using with Google, you know, there's always those notifications like, hey, by the way, you're sharing X, Y and Z. Uh, and I think that's that's something that, I, you know, we have this capability within your, your devices is where also it'll it'll notify like, hey, you have these apps that have permissions that they don't actually need. Do you want to remove those? I'm like, oh, yes, let me do that. And so these are these are this again. It's not just with AI. We have always wanted to be a, are a trustworthy, responsible organization. So these are some of the innovations that we have we've introduced across all of our products. Mar, to, to follow up on that, I like that last statement there. It's not just AI that you have to be concerned. That's always been something that people should be alert to. And there's people that are really hypersensitive and vigilant and aware of that and care. And they don't want um, companies using their data in any sort of way, even if it's to advertise to them. Um, and there's people that don't care, right? That they're, they're not really that concerned with it. Some of them think it's kind of cool. Like, hey, I have been looking for these t-shirts and, and now I'm advertised one. That's awesome, right? Um, and there's some people that that really scares. And I think the people that have always been hyper vigilant about that um, know how to uh, find those toggles to, to turn off the, the training, right? They've done it in other products and it's similar um, with, with AI. It's, it, it's, it's a, a, a toggle, a disclaimer when you're signing up. It's no different than any of the other technologies that are already out there. Now, what you should be more concerned with is business, uh, uh, people in the business industry is, is your company data and, and your client's company data. Um, so from that perspective, that's a whole different ball game, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't, I don't know about you all, but every other day I seem to get kind of letters in the mail about my data that has been breached somewhere, you know, with my dental insurance carrier or somewhere else. <laughs> um, Josh, tell us a little bit, what technical measures can be employed to build safeguards into AI systems to, pre to prevent the generation of harmful or deceptive information. Sometimes we call them um, hallucinations, right? Um, are there emerging technologies or processes that show promise that you can see um, in addressing this challenge? Absolutely, and I spoke on a little bit earlier, um, Jamar touched on it a, a little bit too, but it, it goes back to the, the the RAG approach, right? The retrieval augmented generation approach. And, and when Jamar mentioned it, he said grounding, and that's the same thing, is you're grounding these responses in factual data from your organization, right? So instead of relying solely on, you know, potentially unreliable or unrelated data sets, RAG models incorporate an organization's own verified knowledge sources and documentation. Um, and these ensure that AI does align their outputs with policies and procedures and values of your organization. Um, at Resolve AI, we, we, we've used um, the, the RAG model since day one, right? We, we, never, we never ever trained a, a language model on, on, on companies' data because, because of that concern, right? Um, uh, another uh, thing that uh, we do is a, a human in the loop, right? So for complex or sensitive um, high stakes scenarios, um, we're paired with human oversight. So we can uh, route a conversation to a support agent based on um, context or competence thresholds, right? So um, if we don't have a high level of confidence that we have information that can answer this question, we're not gonna try. We're gonna route that and create a support ticket um, um, or get a, a live chat agent on, on, on the scene, right? I um, mean, it doesn't mean that every interaction requires education, but it's the systems intelligent enough to know when to bring a human into the process. Um, on top of that, you analyze your past conversations that your that your users have, and um, you uh, use those to to ensure that the questions that are being asked that you have information for. And if there was a hallucination, you can address it, right? So, I think that's probably I'll ramble on forever if I don't stop now. <laughs> Jamar, is there anything you need to you'd like to add to that? If not, I'm ready to go on to another question for you. Yeah, you know, you just want to you want to ground your data uh, on your your you want to ground the model on your data so that it's going to give you something that's relevant to your domain versus maybe something that's outside of your domain. It may be incorrect or even if it makes it up. And there's also some controls. Again, this is where the platform comes into play, where, it's, again, it's not just a model, but there are controls such as temperature if folks don't necessarily know what that is, that's okay, but it's a way that you can adjust, say, how creative a model 
can be. You don't want it if, if it's too creative, they'll start making stuff up. And so you can you can control that and you can test that out before it's actually being released to your end users and, and constituents. Thank you. We have a question from Joanne um, who indicates that she didn't see intellectual property protection on the list of all precautions for AI development. Um, and given the ongoing lawsuit by the New York Times against OpenAI for copyright violations, are there any concerns that Google may have in this arena? Yeah, so this is a, a great question, and this is part of um, the work that we've done, and we've done spent a lot of time and effort in this space. This is going to uh, tie into kind of that indemnification uh, that I had described before, um, because you know, similar to um, you know, I'll give an example. You know, I've I've written you know a blog for for Google, and to go through that process, one of the things that they did was. Uh, you know, they looked at my blog and they looked at the images in the blog and they checked to make sure that we have the right to use, you know, these images before I could even publish it. And so when you think about that same approach of being applied to our, um, our, our research team that are developing these models before they are published, there's actually a team that goes in and looks and says, OK, where did the, these training sources come from? Do we have the rights for these training sets, et cetera, et cetera? And so as part of that, um, because of, partly because of that, you know, this is where in, and we can share kind of our indemnification uh, clause, which is really important, which is basically protecting our customers from maybe those IP or copyright um, uh, issues that someone may come back with and say, hey, your model generated something that's from, you know, that's copyrighted or, or has IP around it. And we're saying uh, it, it won't. And, um, you know, if it does, again, we are putting our money where our mouth is. We're going to step up to the plate and defend this within uh, the legal lawsuit. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but that's roughly what that, that indemnification clause states. I, I follow up on that a little bit. It, it, we were using, when we first started with generative AI, we were using open AI language models. And one of the things we do, um, same one of the things that Google offers, we also offer is um, we can put a, a virtual assistant or a chatbot on your website and answer questions based off data grounded in that information. So when we first switched to Gemini, I, I was getting uh, blocked <laughs> by a lot of, the, by a lot of uh, the queries we were doing because the information matched so closely, almost word for word, which was our goal information from the website and Google said, hey, this matches really closely to something we have in our database and it'll stop the output midstream. And it was kind of cool and it was kind of aggravating at the, for Marty's case, but we found a way around it. So I can confirm that that if they, they've got those technologies for sure. And one of the things we do in what you described is kind of recitation check. So again, one of those filters that we apply, once we have generated our response, we do a check to see if it's reciting something you know, verbatim that's that's in our so and if it is, then we don't return it. So we we have all of these checks. There's a lot of things that happen between the time you send the prompt and the time that you get the answers. And we're kind of throwing it through this whole gauntlet of responsible AI stuff, you know, uh, controls before you actually get a response. There was a lot of talk about when OpenAI first came out how 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 Google was going to uh, fall behind and and how the the search was dead and and I actually really respect the path that you guys took to put those protections in and make sure that you have those. So you took a little longer to release what you were doing, but you don't have those issues uh, or as many of them as you see with, with other language models that kind of went fast first and you took the time and did it right. And so I know Jim and I does a really good job of those kinds of things. So respect to you guys on that. Thanks. Really, really nice. Oh, good. So Jamar has um, put some information in there, a link um, to provide uh, more information about protecting customers um, and indemnification. Thanks so much for that. I have a question from a fellow educator, St. Mary's. Um, given the high costs of developing AI, um, scientists in universities will not have really kind of the same kind of access to resources and capabilities as those in the private sector. What do you think about the increasing gaps that this is potentially going to cost 
and and maybe are there ways to mitigate that? Um, and and maybe are there ways that large corporations can help to mitigate that? For me, Jamar, either one. Um, I, I think you partner with with a, a um, organization like Google or like Resolve AI. We can help mitigate a lot of those costs. Um, Google, you you don't have to spend a whole lot of money on the infrastructure, the GPUs or the training or things like that. Google's Google's platform is fantastic. Um, it's a fan, it would be a fantastic opportunity for educators. Um, Gemini is very inexpensive comparatively to other language models, and it's one of the better language models out there. Um, as far as uh, Resolve AI, we work with multiple universities to provide um, support to their students or on their public website. Um, and, and so you don't necessarily have to spend on developing that technology in-house. And I, I almost think for some organizations, it's a losing battle um, that, that you're better off to partner with an organization that's 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 their job, that's what they do, um, or to partner with a, with a platform like Google that provides so many uh, um, awesome resources to, to do that at a relatively inexpensive cost. Yeah, and I'll just add uh, that I, I talked about choice and value. And so we offer the whole gamut that makes it something that is accessible to anyone who needs it. You, we provide a certain level of credits every month for folks to be able to leverage, you know, Gemini within Google Cloud, uh, where you don't have a, a, a cost. Uh, and then if you act, happen to want to go more into that, then we have different uh, variations of models. This Gemini, we have that across multiple sizes, uh, by the way. And so we can find something that meets the price point of the particular customers. And today we also release um, Gemma, I think is what it's called, which is a um, our open model that folks can leverage, which is a derivative of Gemini, uh, much of the same capabilities. In fact, Gemma uh, uh, outperforms larger models uh, in, in certain use cases. And so this, again, is something that these organizations can leverage and build off of without having to have those you know, concerns of, of, of cost. Thank you so much. And certainly as an uh, educator in the community college system, I can uh, certainly attest to the importance um, of providing equity across systems. We're gonna go to our very quick lightning round. We're gonna ask you two questions. This is just for fun. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to ask you hardback or ebook? Audiobook. Very Audiobook. nice. Because I, I can listen to it while I'm working. Right okay. Digital book. Digital book. Digital book. Interesting. Gosh, it's good for yeah. us educators why to know have, that. Why do you have time to read, Jamar? <laughs> and then I'm going to ask you the final question. Then this is the best question ever. This is a Mark Orcutt special. <laughs> Bagels or donuts? Bagels all day. Uh, donuts. Hotly debated in our office. Hotly debated. <laughs> so I'm glad that you are also uh, uh, divided. <laughs> Certainly we have a similar reflection there. So I, I just thank you so much, uh, Josh, Jamar, Mojda, um, for, for your time, your expertise. Uh, you, you bring so much. I'm glad there's people like you working on some of these tough issues related to biases, controlling the temperature, rag models, all these things that are happening behind the scenes of making this technology both safe and effective for public, private sector people, everyday folks, students, people who are engaging with this technology. So thank you. Um, I believe we're in good hands with, with both of you um, um, leading the charge. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope you will attend future events and engage with our policy work through our task forces. Uh, we, we have part three of the series is going to be in person in San Ramon, featuring the uh, president and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California, Atani Kantil Sakaui. She is also a former California Supreme Court justice. So wide ranging conversation on public opinion, politics, the judiciary. I hope you'll join us in San Ramon um, for that event. And I believe there's a link uh, that will be in the chat shortly or visit our website if you want to register. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.